We have a saying, good surf makes for a good surf contest. Simple as that. I've run thousands of contests and watched literally tens of thousands of waves being ridden in a competitive format. The wave park allows a wave to be produced that is now world-class and for the best surfers in the world is a challenging wave for them. When I first watched the Founders Cup a couple of years ago now, it was interesting. People said, ah, it's going to be boring because every wave is exactly the same. The guys are going to all ride the same. But it wasn't. And it's funny because there's all the naysayers that bag on wave parks are guys that haven't ridden one. You talk to anybody who's ridden that and haven't been lucky enough to been ride, especially with Kelly's wave, and they go, hey, this is amazing. Be able to have the ability to run a competition in a controlled environment is, is a dream come true for a promoter. Caught my first tube this morning. Sir. Sir, 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 sir. Welcome to Beyond the Ocean, the podcast exploring surf parks and the impact of technology on the future of surfing. We speak with technology leaders, investors, operators, and surfing legends to explore this exciting new movement. I'm your host, Chris Klusner. Hello and welcome. I am your host, Chris Klusner, and I am pumped to bring you today's episode with Randy Rarick. Randy is a surfing living legend. He was the executive director for the Vans Triple Crown of Surfing for more than 38 years. The Triple Crown is the most iconic series of events in pro surfing. It includes the Pipeline Masters, which if you just look up some of those videos online, you'll be blown away. Randy ran that event for almost four decades. He's been surrounded by some of the most elite athletes on the planet since he co-founded Professional Surfing in 1975. Randy's also an expert in surfboard design and vintage surfboard restoration, and he's been to many of the leading surf parks, including the Kelly Slater Surf Ranch. So he's got a thing or two to share about what the future of surfboard design, contest execution, and really surf parks in general, what that future could look like if done well. So whether you're a surfer, operator, or developer of surf parks, Check this episode out to hear what a living legend has to say about the future of surf parks. Randy, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast here and taking some time to chat. Yeah, it's all my pleasure. I mean, you're all the way over in New York. I'm out in Hawaii on the North Shore. It's summertime here, so it's pretty dead flat, so I got plenty of time. Yeah, well, really appreciate it. I know you got some grandkids running around at home. Is that right? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, like everywhere else in the nation, you know, they've got these lockdowns and we've got a 14-day quarantine. And my kids came out from uh, the mainland and they just got off quarantine. So they're actually down zip lining right now. So they're having fun. I know you have uh, a bunch of grandkids running around. Uh, any of them surfing yet? A little bit, but none of them have taken up surfing as an earnest uh, endeavor. My uh, son has a little five-year-old who's been going out on a tandem board that I made for him. I made an 11-foot tandem board for him, and he loves going out on that. So he'll be up and riding himself pretty soon, like, within the next six months or so. And uh, I got a couple of girls, and they go surfing, but they're not surfing. It's not their main deal. Just reading about your background, you were about age five when you moved out to Hawaii. Is that right? Yeah, I was actually born on the mainland in uh, Seattle. And my parents had both been here during World War II, and they fell in love with Hawaii, so they decided to move here. And Lucky for me, I was about, like I said, five years old when I first came over. Excuse me. And then um, for about the first five years, you know, I was young, just uh, hung out in Honolulu. And then I started surfing at about 10 years old. I was lucky enough. My mom uh, was a member of the Outrigger Canoe Club for a short period, and uh, famous beach boy Rabbit K. Kai took me out and kind of pushed me into my first wave. And you know what's interesting? That was like 60 years ago now. And uh, I still remember the first wave I rode where the fact that the nature, the swell was like a little probably one, two foot wave in Waikiki could propel me along. And I was just amazed at with no propeller, no motor, no sail, no nothing that you got this energy in the ocean and it translated into this ride that I probably went about 50, 100 feet maybe. And the wave petered out. And I remember looking back and going, 
oh, that was amazing. I want to keep doing this. And here it is 60 years later, I'm still doing it. Had your family been surfers? Had you kind of had any exposure before coming out to Hawaii, before kind of diving in head first? No, not at all. In fact, you know, if I probably had stayed on the mainland, I would have grown up to be a hot rodder or something like that. And I thought that I would have become a surfer. So it was, like I said, at 10 years old, it caught my attention. And it really was something I wanted to do. We lived in Waikiki at that time. And so it was really convenient. I surfed out in front of the uh, Hilton Hawaiian Village, which back then was called the Kaiser Hawaiian Village. And that's where Kaiser's, a surf spot, is named after that. And surf there and, and my favorite spot was number three is which to this day anytime i go into waikiki i still go out to number three so i love it that's incredible and and that was really like when you got the bug and what age did you start getting into the whole competitive scene and you got into board building pretty early as well as i understand it as well it's interesting because like i said i started surfing at 10 and i had a couple of neighbors that would pile me in their car and uh i remember one of them had an old greg Knoll. 86 which was considered short for the time and another one had an old gordy and i was amazed that these california boards seemed so much better than the hawaiian boards and we had a couple manufacturers here there was um inner island surf shop and surfboards hawaii and there was this thing for a short term that velzi actually started called bohemian surf properties which really they were going to make boards for the rental fleets in waikiki and i was 11 years old and i remember walking into their factory and they had about Oh, a dozen racks or so with boards uh, laid out and they were taping them all off and putting pigment on them because the foam was so junk they had to cover the blanks so uh, they didn't blow up on them but anyway I, I remember walking in there and i was 11 years old and i was intoxicated by the smell of resin i just went oh my gosh this is amazing and i said to myself i want to make surfboards and so at 11 years old i made a decision that i wanted to start making boards and my first board i made when i was probably 12 and it was an old board with pulled the glass off and stripped it down and reshaped it. That was the beginning at 12. And I got really into working on boards and I started fixing all the boards for everybody in the neighborhood for free. And the idea being to learn how to, and back then there was no YouTube, there was no uh, internet. You just basically had to learn on your own or else go watch somebody or have a mentor. And so at a really young age, I went down and hung out into the surf shops and kind of looked through the back door and was going, Oh, you know, what are these guys doing and learning techniques and, I started hanging out at about 12 years old at the surf shops and uh, that paid off because by the time I was 14, I'd gotten good enough that I actually got a job in, in the surf industry repairing boards at 14. And that's kind of what's sort of funny is I started working then on repairing boards and here it is 50 years later and I've come full circle and uh, I'm doing restoration boards now that uh, are probably some of the best in, in the business. And it's all because I started working at 11 years old uh, with a smell of resin. Especially being able to repair boards and just kind of be around the whole scene, it probably really helped with getting becoming more familiar with who the players were, getting more ingrained in the culture. And did you ever run into any challenges or conflicts kind of being uh, from the mainland and coming into Hawaii and picking up a surfboard and being there in the early days? Any war stories you can share? Well, I was so young when I first came at five years old and I went to public school, so I kind of integrated myself pretty well. And back then, if you were a Howley kid, you were in the minority. So you learned about the locals and the area I lived in had a lot of Japanese uh, Hawaiians. And so I was like the tallest kid in my class. I was like a foot taller than everybody else. And uh, there was all these little Japanese girls and guys. And I was this tall, Howley, skinny Howley kid. And uh, so I learned early on kind of reverse discrimination that if you were a Howley in a public school in Hawaii, you were on the minority. And so you really had to learn to deal with the different ethnic groups here. And I think it, it proved really good for me later in the years when I became uh, director of all the pro events and everything. And I learned early on how to deal with different types of people and different personalities and certainly different racial makeups. And it, it was a really good learning experience from a really young age. So I was happy to do that. But it was interesting because you mentioned, did I have any run-ins? As I said, I became totally obsessed with surfing. And, you know, I played baseball and, and other things you did as a young kid. But I just went, no, nah, I want to become a surfer. And when I really knew I was going to become a surfer when I was 12 years old, because I was in the Boy Scouts, and we used to go every Friday night to um, a scout meeting. And I had perfect attendance for two years. I never missed a single scout meeting from the time I was 10 to 12 years old. And this one weekend, 
they in the old days used to put up posters on poles when a surf movie came to town and a surf movie is a big deal in hawaii because they you got one or two maybe as many as four or five at the most and that was how you found out about what was happening in surfing in the rest of the world and this movie came to town and it was one night only and it was Friday night, the same night I had to go to Boy Scouts. And I agonized for a whole week because the posters went up the weekend before. And I had this poster and I'm going, oh, my gosh, I want to see the surf movie. And it's only one night. And I had to make it finally a decision. Am I going to go see the surf movie or am I going to go to my Boy Scout meeting? And I opted for the surf movie and that changed my life. And from that moment on, I decided, well, I'm not going to be responsible. I'm going to be a surfer. <laughs> Reminds me of how I grew up as well in New York. It was kind of the same, like one night only, you know, it was Taylor Steele when I was growing up was hosting his film in New York City. And that was the thing. And that's such a cool story. And what about your time, your first trip back to California, you know, after being in Hawaii for a couple of years? And uh, what was that like going back to California after that? Well, I had never been to California because I came straight from Seattle when I was five, grew up, you know, five to 10. And then I finally made enough money to go to the mainland when I was 15. And at that stage, I'd already been working for a couple of years. In the, we had a, a surf shop here called Surfline Hawaii, which was a dealer for Dewey Weber. And so I actually got on the Weber team in Hawaii. And so going to California at 15 years old, I was just in cultural shock. It was amazing because how big it was, the car culture of California, you know, the waves. Of course, I'd seen through Surfer Magazine and, and some of the surf movies. And it was really funny because I thought it was always perfect in California. I thought it was always glassy and these great little three, four foot waves and beach breaks. And we don't have hardly any beach breaks here. So I was looking forward to that. And I remember I landed in the afternoon, went straight from the airport to the Weber shop and got a loaner board and put in a custom order for a new board. Went to this a friend of the family. We're standing there. So I didn't see the surf. So I got up at dawn the next morning. I went down to Santa Monica State Beach which is probably one of the crappiest breaks in California. It was like one foot onshore, cold and foggy. And I was going, what? Where are all those perfect glassy waves I've seen in the surf movies and in the magazines? And I thought it was good all the time. So like I said, cultural shock set in there. And then I remember going into the Weber factory and I was blown away because they had like 60 racks where they're glassing and glossing boards. And coming from Hawaii where we had like two racks in a factory, it was amazing. But I spent six weeks there when I was 15 Went down to Mexico and cruised around. A friend of mine had a license, and uh, I wasn't driving yet. It wasn't until the next year I went back when I was 16 that I really got into it. And at that stage, I'd gotten to become a fairly decent surfer. I was competing in the junior ranks, and I won the Hawaii State Junior Championships here in Hawaii. So when I went over to California, Dewey Weber, you know, picked me up personally. And gave, and I had a brand new board, and. He said, you know, you're going to be really hot and good and, and trying to surf in California after coming from Hawaii was really tough. I mean, really tough. So, like I said, it was a, a, an eye-opening experience to be a local Hawaii boy coming from Hawaii and then uh, pitching up in California for two summers. And uh, But I learned a lot and uh, got really in, super in with the surf industry. Like I said, I was lucky enough to meet guys like Dewey Weber, and, and we were the representatives for a lot of the 60s big name manufacturers we had um, bing gordon smith yader harbor and i got to meet all those guys because we were the dealer for them so really early on i got involved pretty solidly with the surf industry that was the days when boards looked a lot different than they do today and there was a lot commonly held beliefs like you know bigger boards are usually better and i'd love to hear a little bit about the exposure to all those incredible different shapers and how the board started to evolve. And then that's about when you started traveling more as well. You're going all over the world. You're seeing how different boards are made. What kind of impact did that have on you? Well, that was kind of the golden age of longboards. It's when the Beach Boys were knocking out songs all the time. Everybody was driving around in a woody and it was all longboards. And it, it was all the big manufacturers were just booming. And surfing took off nationwide. And, and to be right in the thick of that was super interesting. And the board designs were really attractive to me to find out the different. And you, you talk about lightness and stuff. I remember when I went over there, when I ordered my first board, they finished it. And I go, oh, it's not heavy enough. It's got to be heavier for Hawaii. So I had to put two extra gloss coats on it to make it heavier. Because I said, oh, you know, we've got the trade winds in Hawaii. And you, it's hard to get in if your board's too light. And so, you know, we're here I'm actually adding weight to a board, which was kind of crazy. I remember I ordered a board with 
a little more pointier nose because for Hawaii, we didn't need a big wide nose rider type nose that they had that was popular in California. So I learned really early on about the differences in surfboard design and working with Weber was great because Harold Iggy was the main shaper and I watched Iggy shape a bunch of boards and of course worked in the glass shop with those guys. And then when I came back to Hawaii at that stage, by the time I was about 16, I was actually running the repair shop at Surfline and we were probably repairing two to 300 boards a week because we had all these different brands and we were doing all the boards for Hobie. The big competitor here in Hawaii was the Greg Knoll shop. Greg Knoll had established a dealership early on. It's interesting. I started working a night shift kind of moonlighting up at the Greg Knoll shop in the evening. So really when I, through my high school years, I probably worked on 10,000 surfboards. And in doing so, I learned super about designs, fins, building characteristics, everything. So that's where I became a real expert in knowing about boards. Thinking about your love of boards, your love of surfing, you're fully in the zone working with the shop and it's a big shop. And so how does that lead to contests? How'd you make the jump from being so ingrained on the product side of surfing to really like creating this new environment where you can actually have a whole show and entertainment experience? Because that's definitely a whole different side. During those high school years, I was competing myself. And I actually got pretty good. Like I said, I ended up winning the Hawaii State Surfing Championship in the junior division. Then I turned 18. At that stage, I went to Australia for a year. I took off and I graduated from high school. And then it was a real serendipitous kind of journey because in 67, I was a senior in high school and I was doing really good. And like I said, I won the local championships. I met Bob McTavish had come over for the 67 Duke Classic which was the biggest event back in those days on the North Shore. And he had brought the V-bottom with him, which was the new design. It was the beginning of the shortboard revolution. And I was impressed by him. And, and I met, um, he said, oh, mate, you should come down to Australia. So I graduated. And about three months later, I boarded an old P&O ocean liner and went to Australia and lived there for a year. And so I was competing in Hawaii. It was pretty good. And then I competed in Australia. And I would have actually made the uh, world contest team in 68, the one that Fred Hemmings won. But because I went to Australia for a year, I missed all the qualifying events in Hawaii, and otherwise I would have made a team. While I was in Australia for that year, I met Nat Young, I met Midget Fairley, I got to know Peter Druin, Keith Paul, uh, the Australian champion, and I became really good friends. We actually became uh, roommates down there. So I spent about a year in Australia and hung out with all these guys, met George Greeno, hung We hung at Greeno's house and, and McTavish. And so the whole shortboard revolution was taking place at that stage. And I was right in the thick of it. And coming from Hawaii, I was really a unique kind of character down there. Funny little story that the slang they use there. I'd go to a party when I was first there and I'd gotten up some girl and I said, what's your name? And she says, oh, I'm so-and-so. And And I said, oh, I'm Randy. Well, Randy in English language means you're horny. And and the girl goes, well, I'm not and stomps away. And I was like, wow, that's pretty weird. What was that all about? That's funny. Wow. A year in Australia when I was 18 years old had a major effect. And at that time, I sort of semi-coached both Wayne Lynch, who won the junior Australian titles, and Keith Paul, who won the Matt Mintz titles, as sort of an unofficial coach for them. So when I came back to Hawaii, I thought, you know, well, I'm going to really get into competitive surfing at that stage. And this is, like I said, the end of the 60s when the, they were just starting. Boards had gone from nine, 10 foot boards. And we were down to by seven foot boards by the time I came back. And that's when I got into both competitive surfing on short boards and making short boards. So I was right in the thick of the whole transition era from 67 to 69. Like I said, boards went from basically 10 foot to seven foot. What about getting into the contest side of things in terms of running them? Because you, you're competing, you're riding boards. When did that start? I was pretty hot surfer then. I made the, uh, World Contest Team in 1970, so I got to go back to Australia. That's the one that Rolf Arnest won it. And you got to realize this is pre-pro days. There was no money, really. The money just started to come in in the late 69. They put $1,000 in the Duke Classic. They had a contest in Santa Cruz where I think they gave away a couple grand. And then they moved the Smirnoff Contest here to Hawaii in uh, 1970, and I made the semifinals, just missed making the finals on that one, and it would have been great. Like I said, I went and represented Hawaii in the World Contest. So I was pretty competitive. I surfed in the Duke Classic, the Smirnoff. And um, in 71, Fred Hemming started the Pipe Masters, 
which was still going to this day. It'll be actually, if it happens this year, it'll celebrate its 50th anniversary. So I was pretty competitive at that stage. But then what happened, I left for a round the world tour in uh, 63, 64, or 73, 74, sorry. And I was gone for two years. But at that stage, I was competing wherever I went. So I went to Australia. I went to South Africa for almost a whole year and competed down there in the old, what was called the Gunston 500. So I had a real passion for competing. So when I came back after two years on the road, which was like end of 64, early 65, I said, hey, I want to get involved in, in producing some sort of a world tour or something. Because at that stage, there was contests, but there was no way of picking guys. We didn't have any trials. There was no WQS type of scenario where you qualify to get into the main events. And I came back after two years gone and they said, I remember Ken Bradshaw would said, well, things are different now, Rarick. You know, you're not a big name over here anymore. You've been gone for two years. And I went, oh, that's not true. I'm still, you know, competitive. So I got together with uh, George Downing and then really linked up with Fred Hemme and said, hey, if we can create some way for guys that aren't rated or aren't well known to get in the contest, will you accept the guys in there? And that was the beginning of what we call the pro class trials. And the Smirnoff Pro-Am back then was a big deal here on the North Shore. The Duke meet was still going. Fred had started the World Cup of Surfing by 1975. So I kind of, for my own personal interest, tried to get back in the events. And at the same time, got involved in the administrative side of it, working with Fred. So it was kind of a little bit self-fulfilling for myself. But at the same time, realized we needed to, to progress surfing. And this is when sort of the whole new generation of guys are coming on. So the older guys like Barry Kanapuni, Jeff Hackman, Jerry Lopez, those guys were the late sixties, early seventies guys. By the mid seventies, it was the new generation of Sean Thompson, Mike Thompson from South Africa. It was PT, Ian Cairns, Rabbit Bartholomew, those guys coming from Australia. So it was a whole new generation and all this new energy. And there, by then there had been pro money being put in there, but there was no pro tour yet. It was just individual events here and there. And that's why I said, okay, we're going to leak things this together and um, get a little bit more organized. And I just happened to be the guy to do it. I, I teamed up with Fred Hemmings and we formed what was called International Professional Surfing. And we started the first pro tour in 19, late 76. And uh, by the end of 76, Peter Town uh, was declared the first IPS champion. And that was the predecessor to the ASP, which is now called the WSL. So I got involved early on and uh, was on the ground floor of uh, forming Pro Surfing's World Tour. It's such an incredible story, and I, I'm sure a couple minute overview does n nowhere near the justice to it. But I'd love to hear from you, kind of what that inflection point was when money started flowing in. Like, what was it about sponsors, and what was it about surfing that was clicking on a national level, a global level, really? That corporate sponsors saw this as an opportunity to kind of get their name out there and what changed and, and how did you think about that time? Surfing was a lifestyle. It wasn't a sport yet. There was the soul surfers who would just surf for the pure pleasure and, and keep it, you know, they weren't interested in competition. They weren't interested, but there was no money in those days. You won a contest and you got maybe a thousand dollars. And that was a big deal in the seventies. You could live for a couple months on a thousand dollars in the North shore. But as I said, that this new generation was coming along and they wanted to be pro surfers. I remember Peter Townend saying, you know, next year, by next year, I'm going to be a millionaire and I'm going to be dancing on the tabletops with other sports stars. You know, and they emulated the tennis players and what have you. And, and so there was this real new shift in mindset, desire of the young guys. And then the other thing that happened was the beginning of the surf industry, which you don't realize before that there really wasn't a surf industry per se, like we know today. So there was the beginning of Rip Curl and down at Bells and then Quicksilver also out of Australia. In America, there was the beginning of the surf industry, guys like OP and, you know, the early brands, Hang Tan had, had come out of the 60s and they were trying to develop. And they realized if they promoted surfing, they would build their customer base. I mean, it was a pretty obvious decision that up until that point, it was just selling a handful of surfers. There wasn't enough of them. But the beginning of the pro tour started with really the start of the, the surf industry as we know it today. They fed off of each other. And it was great because we started getting sponsors in and you had guys like Smirnoff and Sunkist and and other non-endemic sponsors. But then the guys like Rip Curl, Billabong, Quicksilver, OP, 
they started pumping money into the sport to really build it. And this new generation of surfers for the first time ever went, hey, we actually might make enough money to be a surfer. Instead of going flipping burgers or working in a surf shop or doing whatever you had to do to make a living, these guys actually for the first time started going, hey, we could get paid. And that was the beginning of it. And I'm really proud that I laid the foundation for that to happen. There was something there from where they get enough money that all they really had to do was go surfing. Because up to that point, the hard good manufacturer, the surfboard manufacturers had been given free boards away and that was about it. But all of a sudden, the soft good manufacturers began growing. And then this lifestyle, the surfing lifestyle began to catch on. With the advent of pro surfing, it changed from just a lifestyle to what I consider a sport. Professional surfing made surfing a sport. Up until that point, it was just a lifestyle. Because now, all of a sudden, guys could start making a living and getting paid for just being a surfer. And at the same time, like technology is evolving, computers are being invented. You're get, seeing this stuff on television. So my family in New York, you know, we're starting to see this stuff too. So fast forward a little bit, you know, the Triple Crown, really you're a big part of your legacy for the last 30 plus years. Like what was the role of the Triple Crown now that surfing is a sport and, you know, there's competitive events all over the world, like the Triple Crown in particular and the events within that, you know, really served, a, I think, a different role in a more sort of a proving ground sort of role. But I'd love to hear from your perspective how you thought of the Triple Crown and why you, you dedicated so many of your years of your career to that, those three events. Yeah, well, it's really interesting because a lot of that has to do with politics. We started the Pro Tour in 76 and PT won the first one. I think it was Sean Thompson, then Rabbit Bartholomew, then Mark Richards began his run of four world titles from the late 70s into the early 80s. And interestingly enough, PT, and in particular Ian Cairns, thought that the Australians could do it better. They thought we were from Hawaii, we were a little bit too laid back and everything. And even though we had better waves than anybody else, you know, they thought, well, we can do it better. And they started, as their career began to wane, they were good from the mid-70s through the late 70s. And then they began to wane by the, the early 80s. They began to realize the writing was on the wall. They weren't going to be competitive more. So they began to manipulate and try to form a way... And it was very Aussie-centric to begin with. Uh, the Australians were really always in battle with the Hawaiians. And uh, that's a whole other story, but um, we'll get into that. But from an administrative point of view, they thought they could do a better job. And they thought they had better sponsors in Australia, which they did. They had more money involved. And Australia was really booming. All the surf companies down there had grown tremendously. And by the early 80s, you know, the explosion of the day glow air and that whole thing. It was like, okay, they thought they could do a better job. And that was how the ASP evolved. We went from the IPS and evolved into the ASP in the early 80s. So I have been the director of the IPS. And in 1982, I stepped down. I just basically had burned out from being on the tour for the last seven years. And I stepped down. And that really opened the door for Ian to form what was known as ASP, uh, Association of Surfing Professionals. And they had a coup, basically, that they overthrew the IPS, and it was a real political battle back in the days between Fred Hemmings, who was the head of the IPS, and, and Ian, who had started ASP. And ASP emerged as the uh, sort of the winner between that little uh, coup, which was destined to happen because the Aussies were really on a big roll. So that allowed me to back up a little bit. So the ASP took over. They decided to rejig the tour. Instead of ending in Hawaii, they decided they want to end it in Australia at Manly Beach, which was a total mistake. But they thought, well, we got more bums on the beach, as they called it, you know, bigger crowds and more money. And so the surfers opted to, to run with ASP and they'd moved the tour. And so what we had here in Hawaii was we'd lost the end of the world tour. So I said, okay, we've got to come up with something. We had three events at that time. We had the, what was now called the Hawaiian Pro. We had the World Cup and the Pipe Masters. And then those three, we linked them together and we formed what was called the Triple Crown of Surfing because it was the three events. And we wanted to determine who was the best competitive surfer in Hawaii during the Hawaiian season because the world title was no longer going to be decided. There was decided, I think it was in May in Australia, if I remember right, mm -hmm. the Triple Crown. At the time, it was going to be that big of a deal. But here's these guys all competing for the title. I think Michael Ho won the very first one in 1983. And I think he got a thousand dollars. You know, it wasn't a big deal, but it was the prestige that was came out of it. And then it was interesting because Derek Ho, his brother who just passed away last week, 
won the second one, and Michael won the third one, then Derek won the fourth one. The, the Ho dynasty through that early eight, early mid eighties was established then. And what happened is this: it became this big deal to see who was the best competitive surfers in Hawaii, and to win the triple crown was almost bigger than winning the world title. Of course, during those early 80s, that's when uh, Tom Curran came on real strong and then Tom Carroll, and there was a rivalry between those guys. And so for a couple of years, they kept the title in Australia, finishing there, and they realized what a mistake it was. They moved the title back to Hawaii and, and finished with the Triple Crown. So I had, like I said, resigned from running the tour, took a year off and realized I'm going to focus on Hawaii. And so that's what I did. I said, we're going to build a Triple Crown into something and at this early stage we didn't know but it, you know it went on to become it's been going now for almost 40 years and uh it, it, it a title within a title i think to most people and particularly to the hawaiians it means more to win a triple crown than it is to win a world title yeah and this is uh i mean really when kelly slater started coming on the scene as well i think he won the first one uh you know the first non-australian or not non-hawaiian you know, from florida kelly comes on the scene 95 Fast forward, where does this all play in? I mean, now Kelly's still got the his career going and he's got one of the coolest surf parks, you know, out there. And, you know, it's a real fast forward here, but I'd love to like jump forward now to this new kind of normal we're looking at where surf parks exist. And obviously it's not Hawaii, it's not Pipe, but I'd love to get your kind of perspective because you, you've been looking at surf parks since the, I think you said the 80s now and some of the older facilities that have been around since then. What's your perspective on on that? Yeah, well, it's, it's very interesting because Fred Hemmings, who I worked with for years and, and was the founder of all the pro events, he was the first person to surf in Tempe, Arizona, when they came out with the very first surf park. And the wave was pretty crappy, and uh, it, it wasn't anything to get that excited about. But here was a man-made wave, and Fred actually, interestingly, rode the very first wave. And there's a picture of him standing up very tall on a kind of a long board and cruising in, in, in Tempe, Arizona. And then... During the um, ASP days, we had a, an event at Allentown, Pennsylvania, which was at a wave park there, which was once again a pretty crappy wave. And I think, I think those early attempts at wave parks were more of a novelty than a really good wave. I mean, it was an interesting concept to be able to take surfing inland wherever you know they were going to build a park. But the waves they made for the parks weren't that great. They weren't designed to be good surf waves. They were just designed to be waves that you could ride. But it was nothing to get excited about. And certainly from a competitive point of view, it was horrible. I mean, the Allentown thing was just like, oh, my God, what are we doing? You know, that's actually was interestingly enough, the uh, genesis for Wayne Bartholomew to come up with a dream tour to realize it wasn't a dream to be in Allentown, Pennsylvania, when you could be at G-Land in Indo. So it had its pluses there. But for me to see that was interesting. And then running the Triple Crown and the best, probably most famous events in the world, like the Pipe Masters. I knew what it was to have Mother Nature delivering the real goods and the intricacies of the strategy of working the thing and the tides and the winds and the swells and, and all that. You know, it's totally different from a wave park. But I was able to see that. And then subsequently, you know, as you said, going fast forward, I traveled. I surfed. I saw the one in uh, Florida at Disney World. I went to the one in Malaysia and actually rode that one. I've been to the one in Abu Dhabi and surfed the one in the desert there. And they all were very interesting. And it wasn't until Kelly came along with his wave park that it was, you could call it a wave park instead of a wave pool, I think. Totally. I know you're not necessarily an engineering expert in all the intricacies of how the bottom contours contribute and how that all works. But like from your perspective, having run probably more professional surfing events than anyone on the planet, what makes the perfect conditions for a contest? When you're out there on the beach at 5 a.m., you know, ready to call, go, no go for pipe masters. Now, fast forward and apply that to a, a pool. What's going on for maybe some of the listeners out there that aren't surfers or people that have really don't, they, they understand conditions could be good or bad, but like what makes the conditions perfect from a competitive perspective in your view? Well, we have a saying, good surf makes for a good surf contest. Simple as that. As you said, I've I've run thousands of contests and watched literally tens of thousands of waves being ridden in a competitive format. And I think what you got to say is competitive surfing is really good to determine on that particular day who the best competitive surfer is. Not necessarily say the best surfer is. I mean, a good example here in Hawaii, 
Jerry Lopez and um, see Barry Kanayapuni were amazing servers at both Pipeline and Sunset. And they, you know, Jerry won two Pipe Masters in the early days, but then the rest of the time he didn't, he served, I think, 15 of them. He didn't, the next 13 of them, he didn't never win it. So it's not necessarily the best surfer that makes the best competitive surfer. And that's what you got to really distinguish. Competitive surfing is completely different from free surfing. And there's amazing, great free surfers around the world. And competitive surfers are guys who are able to harness, learn the technique, and learn the aspects of the rules and, and everything that comes with it. And a lot of times people think competitive surfers are boring because they don't have as much creativity as, a, say, a free surfer. But that's the nature of competition. you got to follow the rules. So when you get a surf park like what Kelly came up with, and I think the difference between him is he got engineers that designed a bottom contour that made a good surfable wave, not just a wave that a boogie boarder is going to ride or a long boarder so or 50 people in a pool are going to be bouncing along on their rafts or whatever. He made a wave that was really good and a surfer could enjoy. And if you look at the first incarnations, he actually made too perfect of a wave. The, the first surf when he, it was too good of a tube and it what didn't allow for performance. It just was a, an amazing wave. It was the kind of like the ones you used to draw in your little school books when you were a kid, you know, the perfect little tube. And it was interesting, you know, everybody blew their mind when they saw it. But after riding the exact same wave over and over again, they realized, well, perfect wave is one thing, but a competitive wave is going to be different. So they reconfigured the bottom. And it's pretty incredible from an engineering point of view when you see Kelly's wave where he goes, the machine goes down and there's a, a really good right. The left's not quite as hollow or as good, but it's probably a little more high performance. And I talked to Jerry Lopez when he was the first guy to ride that left. And he said, this thing's better than a right as far as I'm concerned, but he's a goofy footer. So that explains that. But I think, you know, to answer your question, the wave park allows a wave to be produced that is now world class. And for the best surfers in the world is a challenging wave for them. And when I first watched the first tournament there which was the founders cup a couple of years ago now it was interesting people said ah it's going to be boring because every wave's exactly the same the guys are going to all ride the same but it wasn't it was super fascinating to watch how the different styles were approaching this man-made wave that's perfect and you could slot yourself and get a 20 second barrel if that's all you wanted to do but everybody approached it differently so a guy like i remember you know, somebody like Jordy Smith, you know, would be trying to overpower the wave and, and just, you know, really go for it. And other guys like Felipe were just doing these massive airs and tricks and going, wow. And I was the most impressed with Stephanie Gilmore. I thought as a woman, she read that wave better than the men. And I was fascinated watching her. I was going, she's better than the guys on this wave because she's learned how to ride this wave and make it look good. So the argument of, oh, every way is the same, so everybody's going to look the same when they ride away doesn't apply, in my opinion. I think it's a matter of personal style and how you approach that perfect wave. And, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough. I've ridden it twice and, and gone, wow, this is. And it's funny because there's all the naysayers that bag on wave parks are guys that haven't ridden one. And you you talk to anybody who's ridden that and have been lucky enough to been ride, especially with Kelly's wave, and they go, hey, this is amazing. You know, so. To apply that to competition is, in my opinion, as a, as a former director, a dream that I always had. If I could control the, my environment, if I could control the instances of what we're doing and dial it up. And believe me, you talk about it showing up at 7 a.m. at Pipeline and trying to make a call for the Pipe Masters. There was years there where I wanted to stab myself because it was crappy and I had to run it because we were running out of time. So to be able to have the ability to run a competition in a controlled environment is, is a dream come true for a promoter. Yeah, that's so exciting. And I have to ask, I know it's quite a ways out, but you know, with the Olympics coming up, the way I understand it, they're not going to run them in a pool anywhere in the foreseeable future. Even the, the Summer Olympics, you know, fast forward to the next one after the one that's currently been rescheduled, I still don't think is going to be in a pool. But, you know, maybe 15, 20 years from now when they will be running a pool. Like what kind of opportunities does that open up from like a fan viewer perspective or, or maybe um, how does it change the dynamic of competitive surfing when it's less about the location and tribal knowledge? It's more about just executing on that wave or that spot. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that it becomes kind of like snowboarding you know, like they build a half pipe for instance and you've got the best snowboarders in the world, and these guys all got the ability to do good, but who does it the best in that half pipe? 
Well, it's going to be the same thing in the Olympics on a wave pool. As I commented earlier, everybody has their own style and they don't all surf the same. And even though the wave may be the same, it's who harnesses the wave knowledge and, and applies that the best will come out the winner. And, and you know, you're always going to have the purists that say, oh, you know, it's not like having wave knowledge and, you know, being able to read the wave and the angle of the swell and this and that. Yeah, and that's all true. There's no, I don't think there's an argument there. And I, I don't think it's even worthy of bashing a wave pool because it's not a real wave. I think what you want to do is enhance what that man-made wave is giving you. And then the performance level, I guarantee you, will go up higher than you know you see in a normal day surfing. And competitive surfing in that particular wave at that particular venue. As far as Tokyo, I think by next summer, they're going to have a wave as a backup. Because right now, as we're speaking, is, is the time period that the Olympics would be going on. Because I've been to Japan about 50 times, been two feet. And there's nothing more embarrassing than trying to run a surf contest in two foot surf. I mean, it makes surfing look ridiculous. And I think there's, they're seriously considering having this backup wave built by next summer that they can utilize if, if mother nature doesn't provide the goods. And Japan does get good and it can be great. I've been there like in October when there's uh, typhoon swells and it's rivals Hawaii, unbelievably really good surf. But in July, I don't know. That's like coming to New York and uh, being there and before the season hits. So it's happened once. Hey, we got really lucky, but there was, I could tell you the storm damage. We were feeling that in New York for about three months after that contest. And I think the waiting period was two months long as well, or something like that. We pulled it off, but it didn't happen again. I wonder why. That's exciting to hear. Bringing it full circle, what, what happens to surfboard design in a world where you're surfing in a pool? I think once again, Nowadays, you look at it, generally most of the competitors on the tour are riding very similar equipment. And it's no different than any other you know, sport where the best equipment rises to the top and everybody uh, jumps on it. And, you know, whether you're a, a NASCAR driver and everybody's trying to figure out how to fine tune your engines, like, you know, the guys that are winning the races. It's like a golfer's with, you know, the new kind of putter. Everybody's going to jump on that putter if it's good. It's the same thing with surfboard design. Contemporary surfing. It's kind of like what I call an oval. It's always moving forward. It loops back a little bit, picks up some of the stuff from the past. They reapply that, figure out a way to make the rail slightly harder, lower, thinner, whatever it may be, and move forward. But if you generally look at most of the competitors are riding very similar equipment. So it's just incremental changes. It's improving it. I think what the best thing about a wave pool is it allows you to time after time test something out reject what doesn't work, adapt what does work, and improve upon that. Probably you have to go back pretty far to find somebody who rode alternative equipment. And I would say it would be back in the day when Shane Haran was riding the, the keel fin and Mark Richards was on a twin fin. And Shane was an incredibly good surfer. And if he had shifted to thrusters, he probably would have been the world champion. But he stayed with his keel fin and was stubbornly hung on to that thing back in the 80s. And subsequently, you know, Mark Richards went on to win in twin fins. And then after that, it was Kerr and Carroll period where they're riding thrusters. And Shane slugged away at it and be, was runner up two or three times simply because he didn't adapt his equipment. He was too stubborn to do so. So I think nowadays you have guys that serve very similar. Once again, everybody has their individual style, but the basic approach that they're taking to competitive surfing and then it also dictates how the scoring works, too. The judges are looking for a specific type of surfing. As you know, in the last few years, aerials have become really important. And so that forced guys like Kelly and, say, Jordy Smith and, and guys that are bigger surfers that used power surfing before to adapt to doing a lot of aerial stuff. On the other side of that coin, a lot of the Brazilians who are really good in the air came to Hawaii and were sucking when it comes to someplace like Sunset. And they got to put in the time to you know really surf hard. So I think a wave pool will help the equipment improve, maybe not dramatically, but it certainly will be an ongoing progression as they can fine tune it, especially nowadays, because all the boards are basically built on a computer and, and they plug in just really incremental changes. So you don't see a whole lot of difference there. Totally. Yeah. The one thing I've seen for some of the uh, standing wave technologies and the more static waves where you have concrete walls on the other side is they'll reinforce the rails and ironically, like you did back in the day, add a couple layers of glass, make it a little heavier. 
you know, for some of those bigger airs and things like that. But in any case, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you taking the time and, and chatting with me, sharing your story and just bringing it home. I think you mentioned you have an East Coast trip coming up. What's going on in Jersey? Yeah, so what's really neat, I now that I'm sort of retired from uh, running the Triple Crown, the last three years I specialized on kind of my love, which is restoration of old surfboards. And I've probably become known as one of the premier uh, restorers and when, it take, when it comes to taking old boards and bringing them back to life and uh, a real specialist in, in knowledge on old boards. And coming up in uh, October, October 10th, I believe it is, in New Jersey is the New Jersey Vintage Surf Auction. And they've asked me to come out and be sort of the specialist there and uh, help take a look at some old boards. And, and they're going to have a surf auction. So any of your listeners can go on, uh, I think it's New Jersey Vintage Surf and, and pull it up. And I'll be there in, in, on the East Coast. And it actually was supposed to be next month in September. And we were going to think Heritage puts on an, an event there. Heritage Surf Shop puts on an event there. I was going to be there in, uh, by Man- Manasquan Inlet. And uh, unfortunately, with the COVID-19 thing, they pushed everything back a month. Hopefully, the travel restrictions will be uh, lifted and things will be better. And we can all show up and have fun in Jersey. Yeah, a little East Coast time. That'll definitely make you appreciate the... Uh getting back to Hawaii as well in terms of wave quality. And, but yeah, that sounds great. And uh, thanks again for taking the time and uh, really appreciate you sharing your story. I know uh, 40 minutes is not anywhere near enough time to do it justice, but the listeners appreciate it. I appreciate it. And thank you so much. Uh, it's been my pleasure. I, I mean, I love talking surf. I've been, you know, surfing for over 60 years and I still have a passion that I had when I was six year old kid. So it's, uh, it's really nice. And I think the history of our sport is what makes it so interesting. That's why I love old surfboards because the history of our sports actually laid out as, as pieces of art now for that. And competition is always exciting because it always pushes the sport further. I think the, uh, surf parks are going to be growing into something that will make surfing something that everybody can appreciate, not just those of us that are lucky enough to live on the coastline. So it's my pleasure and I look forward to do something again in the future. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. All right. Aloha from Hawaii. This show is powered by surfparkcentral.com, which is the leading platform for connecting surf park operators and developers with wave technology companies, suppliers, and investors. If you're a consumer, an enthusiast, looking to break into the surf park industry, you can check out surfparkcentral.com slash insiders to learn more about our exclusive program for events, conferences, and exclusive content to help you learn about the growing industry and the key players. Check it out, surfparkcentral.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Do leave us a review if you like what you hear. It really helps us to get the word out, get featured, and get more people to listen in. Also, please check out our website, beyondoceanpodcast.com.